Good morning. I'm Valerie Castro in for Savannah Sellers. And I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, a glitchy start to Ron DeSantis' presidential campaign. This morning, the Florida governor is officially in the running for the Republican nomination, but the highly anticipated live announcement on Twitter did not go exactly as planned. Sorry about that. We, we've got so many people here that I think we are, we are uh, kind of melting the servers. We have team coverage, including reaction from former President Donald Trump as we look ahead to 2024. Also this morning on watch, more progress, but still no deal one week before the debt limit deadline. And now with just hours before the House going on recess, a top credit rating agency is warning the consequences of default would be dire. We'll have the latest from the negotiation table, plus a new push to force a vote. Unprotected new this morning, a warning to shoppers about those popular buy now, pay later programs. We'll take a look at how those services may be putting your information at risk. And she was simply the best. This morning, tributes are pouring in for Tina Turner, who passed away at the age of 83. We'll look back at her extraordinary life and the decades long career that cemented her status as the queen of rock and roll. Among those paying tribute, Oprah, Beyonce, Cher, and so many more. She had such a unique voice that will be so missed. That's right. We're going to have more on that coming up in just a moment. We're going to start this morning, though, with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis making it official, filing paperwork to run for president. He announced the move alongside Elon Musk in a Twitter broadcast, which suffered technical problems. NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez has the latest. After months of teasing a presidential run, Governor DeSantis's highly unconventional launch got off to a rocky start. After teasing a run for months with stops in Iowa, New Hampshire, and a high-profile overseas trip, you can see that brighter future. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is diving into the presidential race in a highly unconventional way. In addition to a new ad, an audio-only announcement on Twitter spaces with billionaire Elon Musk that appeared to have technical glitches. All right, sorry about that. We, we've got so many people here that I think we are, we are uh, kind of melting the servers. DeSantis now seen as Republican frontrunner, former President Trump's toughest opponent. Just five years ago, Trump's endorsement critical to DeSantis' victory in his first run for governor. He even touted it in this campaign ad with his kids. Make America great again. But the relationship later souring after DeSantis' landslide re-election win, he now argues he's the best pick to take on President Biden. We must reject the culture of losing that has infected our party in recent years. And stood for what was right. New details about how a pro-DeSantis super PAC plans to do it. A staggering $200 million operating budget that includes hiring more than 2,600 field organizers by Labor Day. But DeSantis still trails Trump by more than 25 points in many polls. Now, in the state both men call home, a scramble for GOP primary voters. We met Trump supporter Monique Pope, an attorney and mother of two. I believe President Trump is the man that can bring us across the finish line. While DeSantis backer Robert Salvador told us he moved his construction software business from Illinois to Florida because the governor removed COVID restrictions early. You know, we saw his leadership during COVID when everyone was yelling at him, you know, across the country and around the world to shut down. The Trump campaign is seizing on the technical glitches of this announcement. One advisor telling me that Governor DeSantis is just not ready to be president and that, quote, this is embarrassing. Meanwhile, a DeSantis campaign official says that the strength of his candidacy broke the Internet. Back to you. And now for more on the launch, we turn to NBC News senior political editor Mark Murray, who joins us now with more. Good morning, Mark. So this was a long anticipated announcement. How have some of the other candidates, including former President Trump, been reacting to the announcement? Yeah, as Gabe ended up mentioning, former President Donald Trump took delight in the glitchy launch that we ended up seeing last night uh, from Ron DeSantis on Twitter. He ended up uh, posting uh, mocking videos. He ended up calling it a disaster and also ended up dropping up other types of opposition research um, at the Florida governor. From some of the other campaigns, they ended up actually using it trying to raise money. 
For example, uh, President Joe Biden's uh, re-election campaign ended up uh, telling people over Twitter to click this link. It actually works to donate money. And so a lot of uh, DeSantis's opponents, both Democrats and Republicans, were having fun at his expense last night. And Mark, both sides are obviously trying to spin those technical issues. Opponents saying it shows that the governor is not ready. Supporters are arguing that he, quote, broke the Internet as interest was so high. But outside of the media bubble, how do you think the average voters will view this? Presidential launches are about introducing yourself to voters uh, at large. And so whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, you want to talk about who you are married to, your children, your vision, your background, your upbringing. And what it, what last night ended up doing was kind of robbing Ron DeSantis of those that kind of opportunity, where so much of the focus was uh, on the glitch. And even before the, uh, the glitches actually took place, so much of the other focus was was on uh, Elon Musk and Twitter's role in that campaign launch. And so uh, campaigns can recover, as Elon Musk ended up saying last night. It's not how you start, it's how you finish. But last night's start was definitely rocky for the Florida governor. Mm -hmm. And finally, now that Governor DeSantis has officially announced he's able to speak as a candidate, what seems to be the main focus of his campaign moving forward? Yeah, one word, it, it kind of comes, it's fight. Uh, and so whether it was in the campaign video that came out introducing his bid, uh, his rhetoric, not only in the interview that he ended up having with Elon Musk and Twitter last night, but also later on Fox News, Ron DeSantis talked about how he fights, fights against Disney, fights against uh, the woke mob, as he likes to call it, uh, uh, the legislation that he ended up passing uh, as Florida governor to really kind of uh, strike back at a lot of his liberal critics. And so I do think that word fight is going to encapsulate a lot of uh, DeSantis's message as he goes forward in what uh, is going to be a very long and hard fought Republican presidential campaign. OK, Mark Murray, thanks so much. This morning, there is a new warning about the state of the U.S. economy as Washington grapples with the debt ceiling standoff. Fitch Ratings, which is a top credit rating agency, has put the U.S. credit rating on watch for a possible downgrade if the country were to default and not be able to pay its bills. This warning comes as the White House and Republicans in Congress are working to reach a deal to raise the debt ceiling and avoid a default before the June 1st deadline. We're joined now by NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles. Ryan, good morning. So the U.S. credit rating was downgraded in a previous debt ceiling standoff. How serious is this new warning and how significant is this development? What sort of impact could this have on those debt talk negotiations? Well, well Valerie, this is important because even if negotiators do end up coming to a deal uh, in the short term, uh, there's a chance that the credit ratings uh, interpretation of the American ability uh, to fund its government and also to pay its debts could impact the overall rating that the, the the investors take when it comes to the federal government. And that could mean that it will cost more money for the federal government to borrow uh, going forward. So a big part of these negotiations is Republicans trying to get the White House to spend less money. If your credit rating gets downgraded, that means you're going to end up spending more money to take out money. So it's just another big red blaring warning that these negotiators need to come to a deal and they need to do so soon or there will be serious consequences. And Ryan, we know there are still several major sticking points that both the White House and House Republicans are trying to hammer out. There's not much time left. House members are slated to go home for the holiday weekend after taking part in votes today. How confident is House Speaker Kevin McCarthy that a deal can be reached in that time? It's interesting. There's a lot of mixed messaging uh, from the House Speaker. Uh, sometimes he talks about how he feels as though the White House is not budging at all. Other times he talks about how they're making progress. He told me uh, the other day that they're going to get a deal not to worry about it. Listen to how he was talking about it yesterday. There's differences. We know where it's at. You have to spend less than you spent last year. That's not that difficult to do. But in Washington, somehow, that is a problem. Let me tell the American public, I am not going to give up. We're not going to default. We're going to solve this problem. I will stay with it until we can get it done. So, so McCarthy believes that there's a deal to be had, but he's also not going to give in on some of these key points. Uh, negotiators were working well into the night last night. You know, they're trying to talk about things uh, like a, n n a larger non-defense cuts, uh, the period of time 
in which the debt ceiling would be raised. Uh, they're also hammering over things like health care and health savings, things along those lines. Uh, they seem to be getting closer, Valerie, but we just don't know what it's going to take to finally get them over the hump. And finally, Ryan, and there's also new reporting about growing angst from Dems regarding the president's negotiations with Republicans. Democrats in the House aren't just standing on the sidelines in all of this. Democratic leaders say all 213 members of its caucus are ready to force a vote on the debt ceiling. What would need to, to happen for that to go through? Well, they'd have to find five Republicans willing to join in, and then they'd have to find 10 Republicans in the Senate that would also agree to something uh, this legislative uh, tactic called a discharge petition, that seems very unrealistic. And there are Democrats that are concerned about the way that the White House has just allowed Kevin McCarthy to drive the narrative here. You know, it, it's not normally like this, where a House speaker talks to us almost every single time he leaves his office. Kevin McCarthy's making himself available to reporters to spin the Republican message at every single turn. We've rarely heard from the president at all, even his top allies, his cabinet secretaries, the vice president. Uh, yesterday, you did see House Democrats start to be a little bit more aggressive uh, in their messaging pushback. Uh, but the simple fact is, it's those negotiators in the closed door room that are going to have to come up with the solution to this problem uh, and land this plane. Sorry. All right. We know those those days are running out. Ryan, thank you so much. Now to South Carolina, where convicted murderer Alec Murdoch is now facing new charges after being indicted by a federal grand jury. Murdoch is facing 22 financial fraud charges, including money laundering. He's accused of cheating the estate of his late housekeeper and insurance carriers out of three and a half million dollars following his housekeeper's death in 2018. Murdoch's lawyers say he is cooperating with authorities and that they believe the case will be resolved without going to trial. Murdoch was sentenced to life in prison back in March for the murder of his wife and youngest son. Joining us now to discuss is NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Danny, good morning. So we first learned about the death of Murdoch's housekeeper uh, during this trial. He's, his alleged conspirator in the fraud case, Corey Fleming, uh, is expected to plead guilty in court today. What does that do for Murdoch's case? It makes it worse, but worse is a relative term. Murdoch's federal case is about as bad for the defendant as it can get, and that's why it's going to be a guilty plea. This case will not go to trial for a number of different reasons, not the least of which is that Murdoch took the stand himself under oath in his first state court criminal case and essentially admitted to most of the conduct that forms the basis for this federal indictment. And even if he hadn't done that, we already know the state introduced other evidence of all of his financial crimes. And then you add to that the fact that his co-conspirator has pleaded guilty. And you can expect that if this case were to go to trial, that might be a cooperating witness against him. This case was made months ago, maybe years ago, before the government even brought it to a grand jury for the indictment. Let's talk about the specifics in the indictment. They accuse Murdoch of routing and redirecting other clients' settlement funds to himself. And according to the indictment, the scheme lasted more than 15 years. So what is his defense going to look like here? There is none. I, I handle cases like Murdoch does. These are catastrophic personal injury cases. And here's the thing. Yes, most of what we attorneys do, especially with our client trust accounts, is on our honor. It's the honor system. So someone like Murdoch can get away with some of these breathtaking, unimpressive scams for a while. But as soon as you arouse suspicion and there's an audit of these accounts, the case is over. It's all on paper. It is really easy to find out whether or not the client got the money or not. What, what makes this particularly galling to an attorney like me and probably attorneys everywhere is that Murdoch had a lot of unsophisticated clients. That came out in his state court case. Uh, that was part of the state's theory there. So uh, what makes it so sad to me is that we as attorneys gain the trust of our clients. In fact, that's why it's the client trust account. We're holding it in trust and they count on us to do that. So yes, you can steal from them uh, if you deceive them. And it makes it so sad to me. Look, attorneys, our client trust accounts, we can get disbarred if we just don't keep good records on them. That's how serious this is. And to see an attorney doing uh, this allegedly, although it's so likely he's going to plead guilty, is just shocking. It's the kind of thing that is very easily proven. Uh, even without a cooperating witness, you just need to get the bank statements, uh, the checks, all the paperwork, and most of the case kind of proves itself. And aside from the fraud case, there's another case that he is set to be deposed in, a wrongful death lawsuit from a 2019 boat crash. Walk us through that one. 
So essentially, the plaintiffs here are alleging that uh, this is a kind of negligent entrustment, that Murdoch, uh, in letting someone, his son, operate the motor vehicle, in this case a boat, uh, he did so negligently. But what this really is, negligent entrustment, these cases are normally brought when you have a tortfeasor, a bad guy like the driver of the boat, who simply doesn't have money to satisfy a judgment, and his son his estate, whatever it may be, probably didn't. So you look around for someone like Murdoch and his estate and his insurance policies that can at least begin to cover this loss, although the reality is nothing, no amount of insurance policy is going to cover the loss uh, that these parents suffered of their child being gone. Mm -hmm. Still so much ahead for Alec Murdoch in yes. these cases. All right, Danny Savalos, thank you so much. We appreciate it. We are tracking showers and storms from coast to coast this morning. Let's get a check at your morning news now. Weather meteorologist Michelle Grossman joins us now with the latest. Good morning, Michelle. Good morning, Valerie. Great to see you. Yeah, we're going to be tracking those showers for days to come. We've been tracking them since Monday. So another soggy day for many from coast to coast. We're looking at the Intermountain West, portions of the central and uh, southern Rockies into the southeast being soaked once again. You can see on radar, you see the green, that's where the rain is falling. And the yellows, the reds, the oranges, that's where the heaviest rain is falling. So we will see downpours throughout the day, too, especially in parts of the central and southern plains. Could see some severe storms, too. And then in the southeast, we're going to see locally heavy downpours. Downpours. That could lead to local uh, flash flooding. So as we go throughout time here, we are looking at a developing weekend low in addition to a cold front that's sort of draped across the southeast. That's going to bring the chance for more showers. It's going to bring the chance for really high rainfall rates. So think those summer-like downpours. That's going to lead to localized flooding. That's today. Then tomorrow, we'll watch that low move a little bit to the north. It's going to spin off the coast there. And notice all those bright colors showing up in the Carolinas. So this is Friday, really the unofficial start to summer, where we're looking at that low meandering towards the South Carolina coast. We're going to see soaking rain from Hatteras to Jacksonville. And unfortunately, it stays in place on Saturday. So not a, gr a, a great beach day for many along the Carolina coast on Saturday. It's going to be rainy, cool, breezy, dreary. And in addition to that, this low is going to really stir up the sea. So we're looking at rip current risks and rough surf at the beaches. So be careful if you're out vacationing or you're living in the uh, Carolinas. We're looking at some rough surf as we go throughout the weekend. This is through Saturday in terms of the rainfall Mounds. We're looking at a lot of rain along the Carolinas. So Cape Hatteras to Wilmington down in Charleston, even Jacksonville, locally five inches. Florida, you saw a lot of rain over the past a few days. We're going to see more. So the grounds are saturated. We could see some low lying areas seeing some flooding. Otherwise, we're looking at strong storms in the southern plains. We're looking at rain in the central plains. We're looking at that rain still in portions of the Intermountain West. The northeast is going to be dry. It's going to be a nice day, but we're going to have a cool breeze in place. It's going to be lower than normal in terms of the temperatures, and uh, we're going to feel that cooler air. We're going to rebound this weekend, though. Rainfall mounts in the central and southern plains into Texas, Oklahoma, portions of Nebraska, locally two to four inches. In addition to that rainfall, we're looking at the chance once again for severe weather. We, again, saw that Monday, Tuesday. Tuesday. Once again, you need to plan for the chance for severe storms as we go throughout this afternoon and evening. It's once that daytime heating gets going, kind of stirs up those storms. Winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour. Could see some hail, some really large hail. Those are the two takeaways in those parts of the uh, country. And we could see a tornado or two possible, but that is on the lower end of the risk scale in terms of uh, winds and also some hail. So as we go throughout time here, you saw today, tomorrow, we're looking at those scattered storms. So much green on the map, unfortunately. Uh, for Friday, we're looking at that rain falling in the Intermountain West into the plains. A nice day once again into the Northeast. Temperatures in the 70s in the Northeast and into the Mid-Atlantic. Coastal showers, as I showed you, in parts of the Carolinas into Florida. That remains in place on Saturday, so a bad beach day there. Humid and dry along the Gulf Coast states, parts of the Southern Plains, but again, Texas, Oklahoma, and the Western parts, you're looking at some rain falling, showers and storms in the Intermountain West, and it kind of stays stuck. We're looking at that on Sunday once again, a shower chance in the Northern Plains, the Intermountain West, Cloudy and damp on Sunday. Dry and hot in the southwest. We're looking dry along the Gulf Coast, too, and warm, too, with temperatures into the 80s and 90s. Memorial Day, I know we're all looking for good weather on that day, but those showers will linger into the Carolinas. And, Valerie, we're looking at those showers creeping into the southern parts of the Mid-Atlantic, uh, Mid too, but it looks like north of that into the northeast, we should keep it dry and warm for Memorial Day. Back to you. All right, Michelle Grossman, thank you so much. This morning, the world is remembering music icon Tina Turner. The news of her death was confirmed in a statement posted on her official Facebook page yesterday. It said, today we say goodbye to a dear friend who leaves us all her greatest work, 
her music. Turner died in her home in Switzerland on Wednesday after a long illness. She had been battling serious health issues for quite some time after retiring from performing in 2009. Turner was 83. Joining us now to discuss Tina Turner's legacy is executive editor of People magazine, Jeremy Helliger. Jeremy, good to have you with us. You know, I mean, tributes have been pouring in from all over the world. Even the White House weighed in. Let, let's take a listen to that real quick. It is a massive loss, massive loss to the communities that uh, that loved her uh, and certainly to the music industry. And uh, her music uh, will live, will continue to live on. Very sad news. A lot of celebrities are paying tribute on social media as well. The biggest names in the business, really. What's some of the reaction we're hearing? Yeah, Diana Ross has paid tribute. Mick Jagger, Rod Stewart. Priscilla Presley actually did, and she said that Tina Turner was Elvis's favorite singer. So that's really, really a high compliment, the highest. Yeah, no kidding. And then, I mean, we're hearing from Oprah, we're hearing from Beyonce, who famously danced, you know, with mm -hmm. Tina Turner at the Grammys in 2008. Cher, I mean, there's just so many legends who knew Tina Turner and were really touched by her life. Yeah, you also had Lizzo. And the interesting thing is that she really touched people who were older and people who were younger. If you were younger, maybe you remember her from What's Love Got to Do With It, Private Dancer, The Best. And older fans remember Proud Mary. And Creedence Clearwater Revival took that song to number two in 1969. Two years later, Tina Turner covered it and took ownership of it. You don't think of Proud Mary without <laughs> thinking of Tina doing the little dance. No kidding. <laughs> she was so iconic and she had such an influence on so many people. Talk about the legacy that she leaves behind. Well, I think the first legacy, of course, is the music. She's the second woman after Stevie Nicks to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame twice. And she has a legacy of survival. She survived an abusive marriage to Ike. She survived sexism. She survived racism. She survived ageism to launch what is probably still one of the most spectacular comebacks in the history of rock and roll. I mean, it's often thought her life could be seen in two parts. There was the first part with Ike Turner and the abusive relationship, which she escaped. And then there was this second part where she became the queen of rock and roll, where she sort of proved, I don't need a man. And even though she was in her 40s and 50s when she achieved that superstardom, which in the music world is, is incredibly old, she really did overcome so much. She was an inspiration, wasn't she? And that's the incredible thing about Tina. I mean, here's a woman who was sort of in the forefront with Ike, but in the background at the same same time. And against all odds, she was able to come back in her mid-40s and become one of the biggest stars of the 80s and influence generations. It's just an incredible career. In one of her final interviews, she was asked how she would like to be remembered. She said, quote, as the queen of rock and roll, safe to say that she still holds that title? I think she does. And it's funny because she, she talked about how she was sort of put in the R&B box being a black woman but her first love was rock and roll and if you look at the people pete townsend mick jagger rod stewart who are commenting you realize wow she really accomplished what she set out to do and proof of that she was inducted into the rock and roll hall of fame not once but twice first with ike and then just two years ago as a solo act absolutely incredible yeah she's just such an incredible talent, and I think that, you know, she's been retired for a while, but people, I think, thought that she was immortal, that she would live forever. Yeah. So this is a real shock to everyone. All right. Jeremy Helliger, thanks so much for joining us this morning and helping us reflect. We appreciate it. Coming up, disappearances and disparities. Startling statistics show more black people are reported missing than any other race. Later this hour, we'll explain why and how lawmakers in California are working to address the issue. First, after the break, a growing threat, a warning from federal officials about the possibility of violence ahead of the 2024 election. This is Morning News Now. We're back with a warning from the Department of Homeland Security about the potential for violence in the months leading up to the 2024 election. In a bulletin posted yesterday, DHS said that this election cycle may put a target on, quote, the nation's critical infrastructure, faith-based institutions, 
government facilities in minority communities. Joining us now to discuss is NBC News Homeland Security correspondent Julia Ainsley. Julia, good morning. So, so give us the background of this warning from Homeland Security and how worried are they about a possible increase in violence ahead of the election? Well, Joe, every time we cover one of these bulletins, I have to explain that they are renewing their threat assessment. They started this right when the Biden administration took office. Of course, that was after the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol. And basically, they always set it with an expiration date. And the last one was set to expire yesterday. So this is the new bulletin, but it's not that something triggered them to go ahead and put this out. It was simply the expiration. But it does give us an idea of where the threat landscape lies. And one of the things Things that they're pinpointing now is the perceptions of the 2024 general election cycle because they think that if people have perceptions that the vote might their vote might not count that the system is rigged or flawed that could instigate violence and they say it's a heightened threat environment in fact we saw secretary Mayorkas say that in the coming months DHS expects the threat environment to remain heightened and that individuals may be motivated by violence to violence by perceptions of the 2024 general election cycle. And so that could mean a variety of things. Of course, the, the presidential election. They also talk about the perceptions of judicial decisions. That could mean Supreme Court decisions that could instigate violence. These are things that they think might be motivators. And they watch for these primarily to try to tell state and local communities and law enforcement agencies what to be prepared for, how to respond, and what communities and institutions, buildings, personnel might need the most protection. And of course, we are already seeing examples of this in recent months. So what is DHS saying about who is likely to commit these violent acts and then who they're targeting? Yeah, that's right. So you have both the possible instigators and then also the possible targets. And yes, unfortunately, they do pull a lot of their information just from recent examples. They pointed to the recent shooting in Allen, Texas, in a mall where that person was was motivated by hateful ideologies. Uh, they didn't even mention it but because it was so recent. But of course, you also have the U-Haul driver near the White House with the Nazi flag uh, who also had some of those same ideologies. Those are all things that they're drawing on. So I think a lot of these are domestic violent extremism, people who are buying into ideologies that are really homegrown right here in the United States. They do say that foreign terrorist organizations could motivate some Americans or some people living in the United States to carry out attacks. But the threat that we used to see in 2014, 2015, earlier, especially post 9-11, from foreign terrorist organizations actually orchestrating attacks here, we don't hear about that in this bulletin. But as far as who they might be targeting, they lay out a list of the most high high value value or highly probable targets here. And they look at U.S. critical infrastructure, uh, of course, faith-based institutions, churches, synagogues, the LGBT community, especially as we move into Pride Month, they want to look at those events and make sure they are protected. Schools, of course, I don't have to mention how often schools are targeted, racial and ethnic minorities, and government facilities and personnel that, of course, could look at something like the Capitol again. But I did ask senior DHS officials yesterday, do you think we could see another January 6th. So what they said is that because of so many prosecutions they've seen so far of people who committed those acts on January 6th, they do think that that's had at least some deterrent effect. All right. Julia, thank you for your reporting as always. Appreciate it. And another warning this morning is raising red flags about the security of the nation's nuclear secrets. A new report from the Government Accountability Office says the Energy Department has failed to protect its nuclear program from leakers and spies within its ranks. It comes a decade after a presidential order was issued to ensure the program's classified information was protected. NBC News Justice and Intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian joins us now. Ken, this report says the Energy Department is under threat not just from outside spies, but from people inside the program. What stood out to you most from the report's findings? Good morning, Valerie. I guess what stood out to me is that the Energy Department, which runs the civilian control of our nuclear weapons, has had 10 years to set up this insider threat program, and it has really failed to do so. And you could almost feel the frustration as you're reading this report by the government's auditors, the general, the Government Accountability Office, saying, look, uh, you just haven't come through here. And they note there have been a ton of insider incidents. Uh, in the most recent year of data available, which was 2017, uh, the GAO said that the Energy Department 
Department reported 250 insider threat-related incidents, and some of them were minor. You know, the, the transmission of classified material or improper accessing of classified material. But then there was a criminal case where an Energy Department official was accused of accepting half a million dollars in bribes. So these kinds of insider threats matter, and this, this agency could not be more important to the security of the United States, and the GAO is really pushing it to get its act together. This all sounds concerning. How concerned should we be about this? And what are some of the consequences our nation is facing if security issues flagged in this report aren't corrected? Well, we reported on one of the consequences that has been playing out. Last year, there was an open source intelligence report that documented how Dozens and dozens of Chinese scientists had worked at Los Alamos National Lab, which is run by the Energy Department and is doing high-tech research. And they are now working in China, helping China build its military weapon systems, in some cases, hypersonic missiles, super quiet drones. And so the Energy Department did not appear to have a handle on that massive technology transfer. That is exactly the kind of insider threat that these programs are designed to prevent. So this could really threaten U.S. national security. You just mentioned the Energy Department. How are they responding and have officials in the department started to work to improve security? That's the good news. They have. They responded within the report. They also issued us a statement last night, which I'll read from. They said, the department has a highly vetted workforce and maintains, I'll paraphrase, a series of programs to minimize insider threats. They said, we appreciate GAO's review and have taken a series of actions to further bolster the department's capabilities to effectively deter, detect, and mitigate insider threats. All right. Kendallanian, thank you so much. You bet. Coming up. Banned from story time. Controversy over a first-of-its-kind law aimed at drag performers in Montana. When we come back, we'll break down the legislation and the pushback next on Morning News Now. Welcome back. We're turning now to yet another state that's ramping up its anti-LGBTQ legislation. Montana is now the first state to ban people dressed in drag from reading books to children at public venues like libraries and schools. These events are often called drag queen story hours. Montana's governor signed that bill into law earlier this week. NBC Out reporter Joe Yurkaba joins us now. So, Joe, what do we know about this bill and what makes it different from other bills we're seeing in other states? Sure. So this new law in Mont makes Montana the first in the country to specifically ban drag story hours in publicly funded places, and that includes publicly funded schools and libraries. And for those who don't know, drag story hours is a national reading program where drag performers read to kids. And the idea is that it promotes things like creativity and imagination. Uh, so Montana will be the first in the country to not specifically require sexual content and performances for them to be banned. And the sponsor of the bill, Republican Representative Braxton Mitchell, told me that drag queens are reading, quote, half naked to kids, and that's why he promoted this bill. Uh, drag story hour performances notably aren't adult themed, though. So when I asked him for examples of this happening in Montana, uh, he didn't respond. Some people and organizations who are challenging this bill say it directly violates the First Amendment. What is their argument? Yeah, so their argument is that it basically con uh, targets the content of drag performers' speech specifically. And already in Tennessee, a judge has blocked a similar law uh, under that argument. Um, and he said that it violated the First Amendment because it was vague and overly broad and that Tennessee needed to make a really compelling case for why it was needed. Um, and we expect to see something similar in Montana. So, Joe, we've seen attempts to restrict drag performances in public venues in a few other states. Those are being battled out in court. This particular ban we're seeing here, do we think it could be an ongoing trend? Do we think other states might try something similar? Yes. So Montana is the third state um, behind Tennessee and Florida to pass such a restriction. It's unclear, you know, what states uh, are likely to pass one next, but it's something that we definitely expect to see happen because at least 16 states have proposed similar measures. So this is definitely an ongoing trend where Republicans are trying to restrict the ability of drag performers to be out in public in front of minors or to read to them in places like libraries. And speaking of that trend, what kind of messaging is all of this sending to the LGBTQ plus community? If more bills like this are passed, what could be the overall impact? Right. So drag is a, you know, long um, 
art form practiced by the LGBTQ community. Um, and so this is really sending a message that it's targeting their uh, art form in particular and sending the message that they shouldn't be able to practice it, particularly in front of children, so that it's harmful to children in some way. And performers that we've spoken with have told us that that really, you know, harms their ability to perform, but also hurts them as LGBTQ people. Joe, just speaking, I know, with people all around the country, we're, we're a week away from Pride. I know you've been in touch with people in the LGBTQ and drag communities. What is the feeling you're getting from folks as, as we head into Pride Month when there's supposed to be so much celebration, but we're seeing all these laws, including ones that are aimed at the drag community? Yeah, people are anxious. They're afraid. They told me that they don't plan on attending Prides this year. Uh, drag performers in particular are afraid that they'll be targeted violently um, or reported to the police. There's also a lot of conflation happening between drag performers and people who are transgender. So transgender people in Tennessee, for example, have told me that they're afraid they'll be reported if they perform karaoke in front of minors. Um, so there's definitely a lot of fear happening right now ahead of Pride Month. So much impact. Joe Yurkeba, appreciate your reporting as always. Thank you. It's National Missing Children's Day. In light of today, we're highlighting a new proposal aimed at addressing the lack of attention and resources provided for black youth who go missing each year. Black Americans go missing at a higher rate than other races. And because of this, lawmakers in California are trying to change this disparity. NBC News correspondent Zinkley Esamwa has the details. Hey there, there are many tools for finding missing persons, including Amber Alerts. But in California, lawmakers are looking to create a new notification specific for missing black women and children. This is exactly the way she had it. I haven't changed anything. Why haven't you changed it? Not ready. Kanitha Taylor's daughter, Kaya, hasn't been in this room for over three years. The then 28-year-old missing since February 2020. Her black Toyota was found running nearby these train tracks in Plant City, Florida. Today, no arrests and Kaya nowhere to be found. Kaya is a woman of color. Do you think things would be different if Kaya was white? Yes, unfortunately, yes. Black women and girls make up nearly 35% of missing women reports of all ages, but just about 6% of the population, according to government data. In response to this trend, there's a new proposal called the Ebony Alert, a public notification specific to missing black children and women in the state. It speaks to the disparities that still exist, not only in California, but across the nation when it comes to race. State Senator Stephen Bradford hopes Ebony will mirror Amber Alerts, America's missing broadcast emergency response. A seven-year-old Dallas boy is missing. The program broadcasts alerts on highway signs, radio, television, and wireless devices when a child 17 years and under is missing, abducted, or in imminent danger. The Ebony Alert includes notifications for black 12 to 25-year-olds who go missing or are deemed abducted, victims of human trafficking, Trafficking, physically endangered or runaways. At 28, Kaya Taylor would have been ineligible for an ebony alert. Her mother pleased with the new proposal, but believes it should go further with a cutoff age of at least 30 years old. I've always referred to Amber Alert as crime control theater. Timothy Griffin studied nearly 500 Amber Alerts from 2012 to 2015. Finding the most significant variable in missing children's cases was the abductor's relationship to the victim, not the Amber Alert itself. His recommendation is a standard normal law enforcement investigation. The DOJ declined to comment on the pending Ebony Alert legislation. But Bradford believes his Ebony effort remains worthwhile. It's better than not doing anything at all. As for Kaya Taylor, her case is still open. How are you and your family coping? Well, we've all had to um, move on in a sense, but we've stayed strong. Kanitha hoping all missing women and people of color get the attention they need to come home. And it's important to add the Hillsborough County, Florida Sheriff's Office continues to ask for the public's help in locating Kaya Taylor. Back to you. Okay, Zinkley, thanks so much. Coming up, a smelly seaweed stretching across thousands of miles of the Atlantic. When we return, why officials are so concerned and the efforts now to clean it up. Welcome back. There is an invasive plant that's taking over parts of the Atlantic Ocean. This is sargassum, a seaweed-type plant that is leaving its mark on the shores of Florida, Mexico, and the Caribbean. And it is coming with a little bit of a stench. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock went on the scene to get a closer look. Spread out over large stretches of the Atlantic Ocean, a roughly 5,000-mile-long belts of seaweed called sargassum. 
In the Florida Keys, we set off with Dr. Brian LaPointe of Florida Atlantic University to learn more about the plant life he's been studying for 40 years, which is now having a moment. We've never seen so much sargassum early in the season, and so we are expecting this could be a record year. In the ocean, the seaweed's a critical sanctuary for marine life. I like to call it a fish factory. <laughs> it provides habitat and nutrition for fish. But out of the water, it can decay and rot, creating an unpleasant smell for beachgoers. Satellite imagery showing its presence across the hemisphere. The question now, why is it growing so quickly? LaPointe, uncovering a connection between chemicals like nitrogen found in fertilizer and human waste and sargasm. Those chemicals, which fuel its growth, are increasingly transported into our waterways due to extreme weather events driven by climate change. How have chemistry changes fueled the growth of this? We have seen a 35% increase on average in this nitrogen content. So more nitrogen, more growth. Sargasm has been around since humans have been exploring the ocean. But in recent years, there's been an explosion of it really starting in 2014. In 2018, there were 22 million tons. Last year, a record 24 million tons. And this year, projections show it could be another record. Depending on wind direction, the seaweed can be either a non-factor on beaches or stacked by the feet. Many local governments, like Miami-Dades, have been proactive in cleaning up the clumps and blending it with the sand with a price tag of $4 million a year. It is a lot of money, uh, but look, our... Uh, environment is our economy here. <laughs> so it's it's money well invested. Mayor Daniela Levine Cava says the county's soliciting ideas for alternative uses and wants people to know the seaweed is safe. The beaches are open, they're beautiful. Back on the boat, LaPointe continues his lifelong exploration with one plain fact staring us in the face. Expect more of this, not less in the future. Yeah, and that's what we're seeing. Sam Brock, NBC News, Summerlin Key, Florida. Buy now, pay later apps have become a popular alternative for shoppers to split up their payments and manage their expenses. But buyer beware, a new Consumer Reports investigation found that using some of these services comes with potential risks. Delicia Han, Director of Financial Fairness Advocacy for Consumer Reports, joins us now with a closer look at their findings. Good morning, Delicia. So these buy now, pay later services, they've grown in popularity over the years. I see them online all the time. What is the appeal for consumers? Good morning. These apps are super convenient. Um, as you mentioned, you go online or you go in stores that are not offered, and there are various um, options that consumers can pay from, can choose to pay with. Uh, they're convenient. They lower the immediate cost of paying for various goods or services, and especially in a time where interest rates are really high and the costs of goods are really high, it's very attractive and it's instantaneous. So you get approved for financing and can pay immediately at the point of sale. So you just issued a report assessing these pay in four services, pay in four installments, and your investigation found that some of these services don't provide consumers with the protections that they deserve. What are some of the major issues that consumers should be aware of when choosing one of these services? So security and fraud monitoring standards across various companies are not all adequate. There are well-known industry best practices and standards such as avoiding the use of a simple, easy to guess password, for example, to sort secure accounts. So there's varying practices that we observed. Um, but I would say additionally, in terms of fraud monitoring standards, although most companies are doing behind the scenes um, real-time fraud monitoring, they don't go far enough to actually contact the consumer and not allow the transaction to go through um, if suspicious activity is suspected. Um, though this isn't the case across all companies, you may be um, using a buy now, pay later company, for example, where there may be suspicious activities, and in their view, the simple auto email um, that you get when a transaction processes is notification. So they're not fully putting consumers on notice of how um, they may manage fraud and what consumers should, should do in instances of fraud. Okay, Delicia, so tell us which apps receive the best ratings by Consumer Reports? 
PayPal scored the highest at 89. And then following that, um, also doing well was uh, Klarna and Afterpay, both at 77, um, followed by Affirm and Sezzle. So what tips do you have for consumers who do rely on these loans, these services to make some purchases? What should they do to make sure they're doing it right? Sure. So check your Buy Now, Pay Later app or account regularly to monitor for fraudulent charges um, because these are transaction by transaction um, loans. There's a lot of um, data that the consumers should be keeping track of and there's various companies consumers could be using four to five different companies so always make sure to review the transaction notifications from your buy now pay later provider additionally uh, monitor your private privacy settings um, in your phone. So even if the app doesn't give you clear options for how to limit um, data sharing, which can open up consumers to fraud, um, check out the app itself um, and see what adjustments you can do via your phone. Do, do some experts feel this should be sort of a last resort for people that they should as much as possible try not to have to use these services or are there some good benefits to it? Look, there are, um, especially in a uh, high interest um, inflationary environment, there is a benefit to a zero interest, no fee, pay and for option. I've used buy now, pay later products. What we want to ensure is that this is actually the case and consumers aren't caught off guard by surprise charges that are not clearly disclosed. Um, and we do find that there are companies that disclose very clearly what the fees are. Um, and so um, check out our report. Um, you'll see who, do, who did well. Okay, a lot of good tips. Thank you so much, Delicia. We appreciate it. Coming up, a medical miracle. A man paralyzed after a crash is now back on his feet. Up next, more on the life-changing procedure that's bringing hope to so many others. You're watching Morning News Now. Welcome back and congratulations to our good friend, NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky, who has become a dad. Morgan and Olivia welcome their first child, child, Eleanor May Chesky, yesterday afternoon. She weighs seven pounds, 13 ounces. Morgan wrote on Twitter, with mom's eyes and dad's appetite, Ellie's already off to a fantastic start, adding that he is now very proud to be known as Ellie's dad. All our best wishes to Morgan and Olivia. There is a News Now onesie <laughs> coming their way, assuming we make News Now onesies. I'm not totally sure about that. Valerie. I wonder if she's going to end up with dad's dimples as well. That would be a good quality. Very yes. cute. <laughs> We end this hour with a medical breakthrough that has allowed a paralyzed 40-year-old man to walk and climb stairs again. The life-changing technology comes in the form of brain and spinal implants. Here's NBC News correspondent Josh Letterman with a breakdown of that miraculous new science. So they're speaking up well. For more than a decade, Gert Jan Oskam has been trying to relearn to walk. A motorbike accident in his late 20s left him paralyzed from the hips down, changing his life forever. But now, Oscom is back on his feet, thanks to groundbreaking digital implants in his brain and his spine. After two days, within five to ten minutes, I could control my uh, hips. It works like this. When Oscom thinks about taking a step, a brain implant picks up the signals and sends them to a computer strapped to his back. The computer decodes it, then transmits the signal to a device in his spinal cord, triggering his legs to move. Scientists say it's like a digital bridge that bypasses the damaged part of his spine. The patient has first to learn how to work with his brain signals, and we also have to learn how to correlate this brain signal to the spinal cord stimulation. Scientists were shocked to find it may have helped close the gap in his nervous system. I'm here. Yeah. In less than a year, Ostom gained the ability to walk with crutches even when the device is turned off. Life-changing abilities he didn't have after a previous experimental implant, which only let him take a few clunky steps. I am in full control of what the stimulation does, and that gives me a lot of freedom, which I didn't have with previous therapy. Researchers say it's an incredible step forward from older technologies that could detect brain signals or stimulate muscle movement, but not both. Putting all those components together in a human with spinal cord injury and having them talk in, in quasi real time, it's a breakthrough, really. It's not a cure. 
Oscom can still only walk several hundred feet a day and stand without help for a few minutes. But for the first time since his accident 12 years ago, Oscom can do things most of us take for granted, like get out of a car or stand at a local pub. It was uh, a long journey, but uh, at the end, I can really build uh, functional things from it. A long journey now giving hope to other patients still striving to take that first step. All right, thanks to Josh Letterman for that report. So far, Oscom is the only person to experiment with this digital bridge, but the Swiss scientists who published his case in the peer-reviewed journal Nature say they're planning future studies involving people with paralyzed arms and hands and even stroke victims. It's incredible. Absolutely. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Good Thursday morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Valerie Castro in for Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, false start. It was an eventful evening for Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who made it official yesterday, formally announcing his bid for the White House on Twitter. But there were some technical difficulties. The governor's critics, including former President Trump, pounced on the moment. We've got more on that and how DeSantis plans to win the White House in 2024. A dose a day could keep memory loss at bay. We've got new research that shows taking a multivitamin once a day might just boost the brains of older Americans. We'll break down the data a little later in the hour. And out of the pool. If you're planning on spending some time at the pool or beach this Memorial Day weekend, you might find that lifeguard chair empty. The nationwide staffing shortage that could really drain the unofficial start of summer. That would be a shame. Yeah, stay in the shallow end, maybe. <laughs> Florida Governor Ron DeSantis finally made his highly anticipated run for president official. But the big campaign announcement on Twitter suffered some serious technical problems, leaving the campaign scrambling on day one. NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez has more. Governor Ron DeSantis' team is trying to brush off the glitches, saying that the candidate broke the Internet. But his main political rival, former President Trump, is having a field day, mocking the unusual campaign launch on social media, calling it a disaster. I'm Ron DeSantis, and I'm running for president. This morning, a very rocky rollout. Governor Ron DeSantis' team trying to recover after a glitchy start to his campaign. All right, sorry about that. We, we've got so many people here that I think we are... We are uh, kind of melting the servers. DeSantis claiming he, quote, broke the Internet, but the audio-only chat with billionaire Elon Musk plagued by technical troubles. There's so many people. That's unfortunate. I'd like to have never seen this before. Frustration heard on hot mics. Just keep crashing, huh? The live stream cutting out and the event delayed for nearly a half hour before finally... I am running for president of the United States to lead our great American comeback. Overnight, DeSantis brushing it off. It did break the Twitter space, and so we're really excited with the enthusiasm. Arguing he's the best choice to take on President Biden. you got to be able to win, and then when you get in office, you've got to be able to deliver results. But his critics could hardly contain their delight, especially former President Trump slamming the Twitter announcement as a disaster. Even President Biden tweeting a fundraising page, dryly pointing out this link works. With the race in its infancy, Governor DeSantis trails Mr. Trump, the GOP frontrunner, by more than 25 points in many polls. But DeSantis is well ahead of any other potential challengers for now. He's just an echo of Trump. I mean, I think that's not what that's not what the American people want to see. In Miami, a group of protesters gathered outside of DeSantis' fundraising meeting in an upscale hotel. We spoke with one of his donors, who was in the room with other supporters as the glitches unfolded. Because of the glitches, in hindsight, should he have stuck with a more traditional announcement? I don't think so. I think it's who Governor DeSantis is. Look, he's a, a bold leader that's willing to try new things, and he's not going to just do the, the cookie-cutter approach. Governor DeSantis is expected to meet with donors and fundraisers here in Miami later today. And his campaign says that despite the glitches, it raised more than a million dollars in the first hour. Now, Governor DeSantis is expected to head to campaign events next week across the country, beginning Tuesday in Iowa. Back to you. Okay, Gabe Gutierrez, thanks so much.
And our coverage of last night's announcement continues. Let's go to Iowa. NBC News correspondent Jack Brewster joins us from there. It's the first state, of course, that will have a say in who becomes the Republican nominee. So, Shaq, this announcement was, of course, no surprise. Now DeSantis has made it official. Is that at all having any impact on how voters are viewing him? Good morning. Well, that will really be the question that we ask folks and that we'll wait to watch to see, especially here in Iowa. You know, you mentioned Governor DeSantis now being in this race. Yes, it's official, but it comes as no surprise. He was here in Iowa just earlier this month looking and sounding like a presidential candidate. Many people we spoke to said, hey, they expected this to come. So now that it's here, they're going to put that closer ear to the governor now that he's a presidential candidate. I want you to listen to what one voter, one supporter of Governor DeSantis told us here just yesterday. Oh, I'd like to see him. Just like Nikki Haley was down the street from me the other day, and my buddy, who is a former Budweiser distributor, lives in Florida, said that'd be a good ticket. As DeSantis it, and Nikki Haley as the VP. So not only do you hear voters thinking about who they want at the top of the ticket, but they're already looking at a possible vice presidential contender for a nominee uh, Governor DeSantis, if that were to come about. So voters are already thinking about it. But yes, now it's official. Now they can really press him uh, as an official presidential candidate. Of course, the headline this morning isn't the announcement, but it's the tech glitches, which his campaign says broke the Internet. Yeah. But his opponents say it shows the governor is not ready. Are voters there reacting? Are a lot of them on Twitter spaces or reading about this? It's a bit early to really see how much of a buzz that will make. But I'll tell you, in conversations with voters yesterday about Governor DeSantis announcing his presidency, you know, one thing we or his candidacy, excuse me, one thing we always ask is what are the top issues that are important to you? So not just, you know, which candidate would you support or how you feel about a specific candidate, but what issues are you thinking about? How are you making that ultimate decision? And None of them have mentioned, oh, it depends on how that candidate announces his campaign. So I don't know if that changes now that you see the glitches and now that you see the a big talk and headlines about the uh, failed launch or the difficult launch that you saw from Governor DeSantis. But that's something that we'll definitely ask people as we go through the course of the day. You know, and finally, Shaq, we know former President Trump has this commanding lead in the polls. It's really only grown in the last couple months. So Iowa is a state where face to face grab gra Grassroots really matters. People want to see and hear from the candidates. They take it seriously. So do right. people think that the gap might close, that Trump may not keep that huge lead? That's the thought, especially the, if you consider the fact that Iowa tends to buck the national trend. You can ask uh, President Pete Buttigieg, who won the Iowa caucus here in 2020, or President Ted Cruz, who won the caucus here in 2016. The joke is that neither of those two men were president. So there is a difference in what you see in the national polls and what Iowans tend to do when it comes caucus time, especially once they have time to meet the candidates, hear from the candidates. Once there's a debate stage, once there's campaign ads, there's a lot of time before voters actually have their say. With that said, President Trump is a known person, a known commodity with Iowa Republican voters. There is a lot of support there, and we heard some of that in our conversations. I want you to listen to what we heard from Republicans here. I don't know. I'd rather have Trump back. But Why Trump? He's always been a nice guy. He's got done a lot of stuff for us, you know. So if you believe polls and you see that it's DeSantis and Trump, right. you're going with Trump. Trump. And why again? He's a nice guy. He, he's helped us out a lot. He's kept our gas prices, everything all down. Okay, Biden got in. He buys all our oil and everything from overseas again instead of using our own oil. Oh, I'd go for uh, DeSantis. Over President Trump? Yeah. Why is that? Trump's got too much baggage. I mean, some of this stuff's going to come and haunt him. Like this young lady might not vote for him because of all the things he's done in the past. But he did a lot when he was president. I think that's important there to show because it shows, yes, you have people who know President Trump, who know his history and know his presidency and appreciate that. But then you have people who supported him in the past and say, hey, it might be time to take this party in a different direction. That will be the fight 
that is to be had here in Iowa and really across the country. Now that this field, this Republican primary field is growing and now that the biggest players are now officially declared. Yeah, and Trump does not have to introduce himself to those voters, but all the other candidates really do. All right, Shaq, thanks so much. Appreciate your reporting. Absolutely. All right, looking at weather now, parts of the country are looking at a stormy start to the holiday weekend. So let's get a check on your morning news now weather. Meteorologist Michelle Grossman joins us now with your forecast. Good morning, Michelle. Good morning to you both. And we are looking it's a little stormy still in spots. So you're going to need the umbrellas if you're in places like the Intermountain West, part, portions of the Central and Southern Plains. We could even see some strong storms in the Southern Plains later on this afternoon, much like we saw Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. The biggest risk will be large hail, some really damaging winds, winds gusting over 60 miles per hour. We can't rule out a tornado or two, but winds and hail will be the biggest threats there. Sunny and warm along the Gulf Coast. Once again, we're looking at a front draped across Florida that's going to bring the chance for some showers, some heavy downpours. Also, we have a developing low off the coast there, so that's going to bring some scattered showers and we'll bring some rain into the forecast. Into the Carolinas tomorrow, cooler to the north. We had a cold front that came through. That's going to bring some cooler air, some breezy conditions. Uh, the breezes, the winds should die down later on this afternoon, but we're still going to be below normal for this time of year. And then let's look towards the weekend because I know we're all ready for this holiday and we're looking at some travel impacts, unfortunately. So tomorrow, I mentioned that developing low off the southeast coast. That's going to meander up to the north. It's sort of just going to spin off the coast there. It's going to bring heavy rain at times to North Carolina, South Carolina, portions of Florida as well. So heavy rain, high winds, coastal flooding. It's going to kick up the surf too. So dangerous beach days there where we're looking at rip current risks and also uh, some really high waves. To the west, we're looking at widespread thunderstorms, high plains, a severe threat once again on Friday. So we have that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We're going to see it again today. We're going to see it again tomorrow. We're sort of stuck in this pattern. And then tomorrow, if you're traveling on the roadways, we're looking at hazard hazardous driving conditions in the northern plains, the Intermountain West, into the central and southern plains. The Carolinas, we are also looking at the chance for some hazardous conditions in terms of driving Nashville to Wilmington on I-40. And we zoom in closer here. The good news is we're looking at a nice day on Saturday, even Sunday, Monday in Boston. So portions of the northeast looking really good. Uh, New York City, too, sunny and seasonal. Washington, D.C., we have that coastal low that could creep into the southern parts of your area. So we're looking at the chance of an increasing shower threat as we go throughout the weekend. Saturday looks like it will be dry. Sunday, Monday, we, Sunday and Monday, we could introduce some showers. And then for uh, Minneapolis and Chicago, looking good, bright and sunny. Temperatures in the 80s by Memorial Day into the mid-80s. A warming trend throughout the Memorial Day weekend. Chicago, you're going to be into the 80s on Monday. Detroit, same story. St. Louis, near 90 degrees on Monday. And then as we head down towards the south, they mentioned those showers in place. We have a frontal boundary that's bringing the western parts of Oklahoma and Texas uh, with some showers. And Florida, we're looking at those afternoon showers for those summer-like downpours uh, that we could see Friday and then over the weekend. Back to you both. But a nice holiday weekend for a good chunk of the country. That's good to see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Coming up on this hour of Morning News Now, a potential bummer for the unofficial start of summer. Turns out there's another major lifeguard shortage at pools and beaches across the country, how it could affect your holiday weekend. Plus, we are exactly one week from a potential debt default, and now a credit rating giant is issuing a new warning for the U.S. that could throw a wrench into negotiations. We've got the latest next. Now to Washington and a new threat this morning that the U.S. is facing a financial downgrade over the debt ceiling standoff. We're exactly one week away when the U.S. could potentially default and not be able to pay its bills. And this morning, the credit rating agency Fitch has issued a warning that it is on, that they are on watch to potentially downgrade the U.S.'s triple A credit rating. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Kristen Welker joins us now. Kristen, good morning. So this downgrade warning, what's the reaction to that this morning? Well, first of all, what it means, they're basically putting Washington on notice. And part of what Fitch said is that there's too much partisan bickering. Sit down and get this deal done. I talked to Democratic and Republican sources overnight who said this is effectively an alarm bell, in part because think about what happened in 2011. There were all sorts of warnings that came in from credit rating agencies. They struck a deal in the 11th hour, but the S&P, which is a different credit rating agency, downgraded the U.S.'s credit rating anyway. And what happens in that case? You see 
stock market drop significantly. And in this case, because the economy is still struggling to get back on track, it could lead to a recession. So in talking to my sources, I am told that it will undoubtedly add new urgency to these talks. And if you look at the polls, 71 percent of Americans say they are very or somewhat concerned about this situation. The message from all sides is sit down and get a deal. June 1st, one week away. Yeah. We know that there have been some talks. Is there any progress being made? Actually, I talked to some sources overnight who say there is some progress. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy signaled that there was progress. The question is, where's the progress? The biggest sticking point has consistently been this issue of spending. You have Republicans saying that they want effectively to lower spending. That would create some really big cuts in things like health care and education. So Democrats are not going along with that. They say, let's freeze spending instead. And Republicans say that just doesn't go far enough. So that's where part of the real tension comes in. And get this, guys, we are heading into the Memorial Day weekend, as you all know, as you've been reporting on throughout the morning. What does that mean? Well, uh, Republicans and Congress are about to go on recess. President Biden is about to leave for the weekend. I think it would be really politically problematic for all sides if they left Washington without a deal. So I think that's going to be yet another pressure point. We'll have to see what happens today. We know the Treasury Secretary has issued mm -hmm. yet another warning. The White House says that Republicans are basically holding Americans hostage. What are the arguments that we are hearing? Here? Well, and we heard those arguments really ramp up overnight. We saw the finger pointing intensify. You're absolutely right. You have Democrats saying that Republicans are holding this country hostage over this issue because they are asking for these spending cuts and other concessions. The president has always said, let's just raise the debt ceiling without strings attached. Let's talk about the budget at a different time and in a separate way. And Republicans are saying absolutely not. They do want to seek some type of concessions in this moment, in part because they know that they have leverage for it. The president has consistently said he's not going to negotiate, and now he effectively is. A source close to Speaker McCarthy overnight, effectively criticizing the White House, saying this is why these negotiations should have started sooner. But guys, it's that partisan bickering, that very thing that in part led Fitch to issue that warning. So if you are someone sitting on your couch watching all of this unfold, you could potentially see the frustration start to mount throughout households all across the country as well. Because if we do default, which has never happened in U.S. history, that would undoubtedly really be a big blow to the economy. And that would be a big blow to pocketbooks all across this country. Kristen Welker, good to have you here Great in person. To see good you guys. to see you. Thanks for breaking it all down for Thank us. Thank you. Now, anti Putin Russian fighters have claimed responsibility for the assault against the Russian army in the border region of Belgorod. The fellow Russians appearing to carry it out using American made military vehicles. Russia's defense minister has now launched a counter terrorism sweep. NBC News correspondent Molly Hunter has the story. Saboteurs, far-right Russian nationalist militias who have taken up arms against the Kremlin inside Russia, speaking out on the Ukrainian side of the border. The operation is ongoing. New video shows these anti-Putin fighters appearing to use American-made tactical vehicles, MRAPs and Humvees, in Russia's Belgorod region. It happened in a brazen cross-border attack earlier this week and raising questions about where they acquired the equipment and what kind of backing they get from Kyiv. Obviously a lot of encouragement. Planning? Okay. Planning, we could consult. Speaking is Russian far-right nationalist Denis Nikitin. He's espoused neo-Nazi views. He's the leader of a group called the Russian Volunteer Corps, who, along with the Freedom of Russia Legion, claims credit for the assault inside Russia. Are you planning to carry out wider operations? Absolutely. This one is a success. The Ukrainian government officially denies they have any connection to these groups. They're hoping that in some small way they can contribute to the downfall of the Putin regime. They believe that a Russian defeat in Ukraine hastens the downfall of the regime in Moscow. Russia's defense minister sending a top general to the region to lead a massive counterterrorism sweep, but it draws critical resources away from Russia's border defense. Our thanks to Molly Hunter for that report. Well, the Kremlin says it's obvious how this equipment got into the hands of these militias. The State Department says it doesn't support the use of U.S.-made equipment for attacks inside Russia, and it's looking into the reports. More international headlines now. This morning, a massive live fire drill by U.S. and South Korean forces near the North Korean border. NBC's Claudio Lavanga joins us from Rome with that and other world headlines. Claudio, good morning.
Good morning. That's right. The South Korean and U.S. militaries this morning conducted their largest ever fire drill despite warnings by North Korea that it will not tolerate such exercises. Now the drills were the start of a five-round training that will run through June 15th. A South Korean defense ministry said that the exercises included advanced weaponry, attack helicopters and drones. The drills add to the display of force between Seoul and Washington as they mark their 70th anniversary of alliance. And we travel to central Sydney in Australia where a massive fire broke out in a multi-story building. The fire engulfed an abandoned hat factory nearby Sydney's central railway station, making the walls collapse. Over 30 fire trucks and 120 firefighters attended the scene. Emergency services evacuated people from nearby building buildings. The fire has been contained and no deaths have been reported, but one firefighter did suffer minor burns. And we end up in Panama, where sea turtles now have the legal rights. The new law gives sea turtles the right to an environment free of pollution and other human impacts that could cause them physical harm. It also allows citizens of Panama to be the voice of sea turtles and defend them legally. The Sea Turtle Conservancy is already making use of the new law to go after illegal egg hunters, guys. All right. Rights for turtles. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> Claudio, thank you so much. Rapper Fetty Watt has been sentenced to six years in prison for his role in a drug trafficking scheme. The 31-year-old, whose real name is Willie Jr. Maxwell II, was sentenced in a Long Island courtroom for conspiracy to distribute cocaine. He pleaded guilty last August in a scheme to ship drugs from the West Coast to be sold in the New York area. In addition to the prison time, he was also sentenced to five years of post-release supervision. NBC News has reached out to his attorneys for comments. Coming up, a pre-Pride Month controversy that has one major retailer playing defense. Why Target is now pulling some of its products that celebrate the LGBTQ community just days before the start of Pride Month. Plus, could a once-a-day multivitamin help slow memory loss in older Americans? We've got new research right after this. You're watching Morning News Now. Welcome back. One of the most popular retail stores in the country is taking some heat. Target is at the center of a major controversy over its new Pride Month collection. And the retail giant is not alone, joining some other big brands facing criticism from conservative groups. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer has the story. Target, one of the nation's largest retailers, is pulling some products that celebrate Pride Month off store shelves. Citing threats to employees, the company says, given these volatile circumstances, we are making adjustments to our plans, including removing items that have been at the center of the most significant confrontational behavior. Okay, these are like naked people in shirts. The retailer removing LGBTQ brand App Prowlin from their stores and website, whose products featured satanic themes. Target also reportedly reviewing its adult collection of tuck-friendly swimsuits that allows trans people who have not had gender-affirming operations to conceal their private parts. Those items have been at the center of misinformation. Uh, the misinformation here was that kids were being targeted with this stuff. They realized if they can threaten enough people, if they can scare enough people in real-life locations, that maybe support for the LGBTQ community will diminish among corporations. Hi. Impressive carrying skills, right? Target is hardly the only corporation under attack. Last month, after a transgender influencer promoted Bud Light, conservative commentators and some celebrities called for a boycott. Sales slumped nearly 30%. I think there's this really small group who has an outsized voice at this moment in time, and it's of hate, and it's of hate discrimination, and it's violent. Corporations and controversy with Pride Month days heard. away. Miguel Almaguer, Pride NBC News. Celebrating who we were born. In honor of AAPI Month, this morning we're taking a closer look at funding and support for this community. In the wake of the rise in anti-Asian hate and discrimination, there's been rapid growth of all types of projects from nonprofits to startups. NBC News business and data reporter Brian Chung has the details. This is something that is so hard to find. This one, for example, is Hong Finger, Xiao Ro. Hong Xiao Ro. Finger licking braised pork flavor <laughs> Hong Xiao Ro. Lay's chips. chips, yeah. <laughs> Special Pringles, strawberry koala cookies, canned milk tea. You won't easily find these things at your local grocery store. This Classic. right here, 
I us. grew up on this stuff. <laughs> Andrea Shu founded grocery delivery service Umami Cart in 2021 to bring so Asian awesome. ingredients and foods straight to your door. But pitching that idea to bankers wasn't easy. Initially, it was hard to explain to someone and answer the question of, well, why can't you buy this at any grocery store? Like, why can't you just take any soy sauce that's available? And why does it have to be like five different types? Dark soy sauce, light soy sauce, et cetera, right? Shu found support in a key ally for Asian American entrepreneurs, Gold House, the same organization that promoted Best Picture Oscar winner, Everything Everywhere, all at once. Mrs. Wang, are you with us? I am paying attention. The nonprofit collective says with its $30 million fund, it's backed 68 Asian American companies in the year since its launch, including names like Sanzo Sparkling Water and fintech firm Nama. This desire to launch and support the AAPI community picked up steam as a result of current events. I think with a lot of the aftermath during COVID, as well as a lot of the anti-Asian violence, it did come to the forefront of minds both for the investment and startup community, but as well for kind of like the broader um, impact-oriented community wanting to protect these audiences. And it's not just Gold House. Big-name businesses are pouring millions of dollars in support, including Google, as well as high-profile leaders like Zoom's Eric Yuan. Nonprofits have been major beneficiaries over the last few years. The Asian American Foundation, just started two years ago, says it's raised over $1 billion dollars. Asian Americans advancing justice doubled in size. So did leadership education for Asian Pacifics. The goal now, to keep the momentum. So is that a weird situation where these negative headlines have to continue for the money to continue to support nonprofits like yourself? That's the hard thing, right? In, in, in the kind of grief and in the negativity um, that has come upon our community, it has also brought resources to our community. There's still more work to be done. One report from 2018 says for every $100 donated by foundations for philanthropic reasons, only 20 cents are given to AAPI communities. I am concerned as to whether or not there's companies who made pledges, um, foundations who made pledges are really going to stay the course with our community. At Umami Cart, Andrea Shu is seizing the moment, all in the greater goal of making Asian foods and flavors more accessible, from chili oil to mushroom umami sauce. That you put on rice and it's amazing. This is probably one of my favorite things. Umami sauce from Umami Cart. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Chung, NBC News. There is new breakthrough medical information that could provide the key to slowing memory loss, and the answer may be in your multivitamin. The benefits of taking a daily supplement have long been debated, but this new research appears to show that taking a multivitamin may help slow down memory loss as we get older. Let's bring in NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar for more on this. So what did this study show, especially compared with previous studies we've seen on multivitamins and memory loss? Right, which are always a little bit up and a little bit down. So today we have a story that's pretty interesting. Encouraging. So this was a study that looked at individuals over the age of 60. They compared two groups. One group got a multi every day. The other group did not get a multivitamin every day. And after one year, there appeared to be a slowing of memory loss in the people who took the, the multivitamin. And specifically, what we refer to as immediate recall. So your ability to immediately recall something, which would be nice for all of us. <laughs> um, and, and the authors estimate that this basically equates to about three years of you know memory loss that was saved in this particular group. You mentioned, and we always talk about, studies are up, studies are down. This kind of piggybacks on another study from the fall that also showed this, but actually even more broader cognitive benefit. And I, and I said this this morning, we love nothing more in science than when we can replicate a finding. Mm -hmm. So again, it's not gonna be the final word. I'm not saying go run out and get your multivitamin today, but it's definitely interesting news. And I think we're, we might be onto something. Is there any particular vitamin within the multivitamin that seems to have helped the most? So as we know, those labels can be pretty dizzying. <laughs> the, the authors basically pull out, single out a couple of them that they think are probably important, including vitamin A, vitamin D, B12, thiamine, riboflavin, those are all B vitamins, as well as manganese. And I think it's important to say, we never say anything is in just the pill. It does, it's not a substitute for, for lifestyle and diet, of course, but those are the nutrients that they think could play a role, these micronutrients that are really important to your brain health. So this study, I guess, looked specifically at one brand, which was Centrum, Centrum Silver, yes. which is which is a popular one. So yes. folks looking, oh, I don't I don't have that one. Right. 
Should they be worried? Should they take that one? What what can they do? Right. So uh, essentially the recommendation is to look for a good quality vitamin. And you ask yourself, what does that mean? Because we know the FDA does not regulate the supplement industry. What you're looking for on the label is something called USP. That stands for United States Pharmacopeia. Um, and that is basically a nonprofit independent group that tries to verify and validate what's on a, a label. Um, you also want to avoid mega doses. You don't want things that say a thousand percent of the daily allowance or two 200%, right? You, to even good things, too much of anything is not a good thing. And you also might want to consider age and gender related um, issues. For example, pre versus postmenopausal women may have different calcium and vitamin D requirements and that kind of thing. So for folks who are watching this and yes. see, you know, vitamins useless, vitamins great, and they see the studies <laughs> yes. go up and down. Just what mm -hmm. is your advice as people take this off? So when, when the first, when I heard the study, I thought to myself, huh, like a little, you know, a little cynical, like, oh, really, right? Because we do. I remember the first study I ever reported on 10 years ago was a multivitamin study, that it didn't prolong life and it didn't prevent cancer. So as I said earlier, the fact that this was replicated from a prior study a couple of months ago is definitely interesting. I think the take message here is that it might be beneficial. We need longer studies, bigger studies, and it's probably not harmful. All right. It's the best I can give you. Appreciate that. Dr. Azar, as always, thank you so you much. Coming up on Morning News Now, why are Americans so obsessed with where they work and what they do for a living? It is a go-to topic of conversation, and many people's identities are really shaped by their jobs. We're going to take a look at how this has happened, and we'll have some tips on how you can reclaim a little work-life balance. Next. People are getting ready to hit the road for the Memorial Day weekend. Nearly 43 million Americans are expected to travel for the holiday this year. And for those of you who are choosing to drive, there's some good news. Gas prices are significantly down compared to this time last year. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa joins us now from Chicago. So Maggie, what is it going to cost for drivers to gas up for their holiday travel? Yeah, so Valerie, as you said, it's much better than a year ago. It's rare, as you know, that we stand basically in front of a gas station and have good news. But you can see here in Chicago, it's 4.79 for a gallon of regular. But that national average is really what everyone is focusing on. AAA right now has it at 3.57 a gallon. That is down more than a dollar, 4.60 from where it was. A year ago, it was 460 last Memorial Day weekend. So a lot of good news for drivers out there who are used to or have memories of those high summer gas prices. At least we're starting off a lot lower, saving people some money as they hit the road this weekend, Valerie. And Maggie, aside from those gas prices, the other big question, of course, is always how much traffic are we expecting? What is the best time, yes. the sweet spot to hit the road? I know this number is a little painful. 37 million people expected to drive over the Memorial Day weekend. And experts say if you want to avoid the worst of it, essentially avoid, if you can, hitting the road tomorrow. Tomorrow, Friday, is expected to be the heaviest travel day. And then it'll kind of lighten up Saturday and Sunday. That being said, regardless of what day you hit the road, experts say another good tip is to try to drive in the morning or in the evening. They note the worst time as far as congestion goes. Again, any day, pretty much any city, the worst time is between 3 and 6 p.m. So you want to avoid that kind of late afternoon rush. That tends to be the heaviest traffic, Valerie. All right, good to get that early start. And for those of us who are choosing to fly, airlines are forecast that this could be their busiest summer ever. Are they taking any steps to prevent cancellations and some of those delays that we've seen really cause headaches in the past? I know. It's like we have so many traumatic memories from traveling <laughs> last summer, and, and airline passengers really have them, too. Last Memorial Day weekend, we saw chaos. It was severe weather. It was staffing shortages. And as you said, this one expected to be potentially even busier. It's roughly 3.4 million expected to fly. And all the airlines say, with those memories fresh of last summer, they are staffing up. Specifically, Delta and American tell us they just struck new deals with their pilots. TSA also saying they're seeing higher employee recruitment and retention rates. So the airlines and TSA tell us that we shouldn't see repeats of last summer. That being said, the gold standard advice still holds true. Get to the airport at least a couple of hours before your flight and download the airlines app ahead of time so you can get those alerts if something does go awry. But again, fingers crossed, Valerie, that we don't see any repeats of what we saw last summer. And we're told it's looking good. And Meg, I know you said tomorrow is probably one of the worst days to leave. How about coming back home? I'm assuming Monday might not be a great day to hit the roads either. 
Monday's not a great day. Yeah, it's kind of the predictable days that you would think of. A lot of people off work early on Friday or they work from home, so they have that flexible schedule. Monday's not great either, but that's kind of why we saw the travel rush starting Wednesday, yesterday. A lot of people thinking of today as a possible getaway day as well. So perhaps if you can even wait to come home on Tuesday, especially if you have that remote work option, experts say it will at least be worth your while as you're hitting the roads. And in fact, it's so bad that officials across the country, Washington State, over to Maryland, are asking people to please use calls caution on the roads, drive slowly, drive carefully, because they know, uh, just like the rest of us, they're seeing these predictions and they just want everybody to get to where they need to be safely and comfortably as they can. Valerie. All right. Surely a lot of people out there this weekend. Maggie, thanks so much. Financial headlines now. Potential layoffs coming for some Verizon employees. CNBC's Bertha Coombs joins us now with that and other news. Good morning, Bertha. Hey, good morning, Valerie. Yeah, we are hearing uh, Verizon has reportedly warned customer service employees of impending layoffs. The Verge reports the company held a call with employees yesterday notifying them of upcoming, quote, restructuring and streamlining measures that are all but certain to result in significant job cuts. It'll share more details with them today. Verizon reported disappointing earnings last month hit by losses in its wireless subscribers. Airbnb, meantime, is preparing for an anti-party summer. So if you're thinking about renting a place and having a blowout, think again. The company is imposing a crackdown for the Memorial Day and Fourth of July holiday weekends as it works to ease restrained relations or strained relations rather between hosts and guests and some of the neighbors of Airbnb hosts. Airbnb's uh, system is designed to identify and then block one and two night reservations that it believes are high risks for unauthorized parties. Potential red flags include whether the booking is last minute. Airbnb is also encouraging neighbors to report parties to a support line. And if you're wondering what's going to be the big hit next holiday season, well, Sony has confirmed that it's working on a handheld device that lets you stream any game from your PlayStation 5 console using remote play over Wi-Fi. Sony teasing what it calls Project Q at a PlayStation showcase event yesterday. The device has an 8-inch HD screen and the same buttons and features as a wireless controller. The Q handheld is expected to launch later this year, although Sony isn't saying when or how much it might cost. But I got to tell you, I looked on Twitter and it's the third trending topic already. <laughs> So a lot of folks will be looking for this. Another one of these things that'll probably be hard to find. Back Certainly to you. some interest, to put it mildly. All right, Bertha, thank you so much. Here's a big question. How important is your work to your personal identity? To put it another way, are you one of those people who makes a new acquaintance and immediately asks them, what do you do? <laughs> well, our next guest argues many of us need to get our lives back and stop being defined by our jobs. Simone Stolzoff, journalist and author of The Good Enough Job, Reclaiming Life from Work, joins us now to unpack all of this. So, Simone, thanks for joining us. Give us an overview here. How do you think we even got to the point where our identities are so tied up with what we do? And is this a uniquely American problem? I do think it's particularly prevalent here in the United States. It's a country where we have an incredibly individualistic culture. And if you think about historically, the Protestant work ethic and capitalism were really the two strands that entwined to form our country's DNA. But more recently, I've observed how the decline of other sources of identity and meaning, like organized religion and neighborhood and community groups, have left this void where Americans are looking for belonging and purpose from their jobs. So we're, talk to us about your journey writing this book. Were you someone whose job defined them? I think very much so. You know, I'm smack dab in the middle of the millennial generation, and I was raised with certain scripts about the value of pursuing a dream job or to follow my passion. And so I spent my 20s really playing Goldilocks with different careers. I worked in advertising, and I worked in tech, and I worked in design, and I worked in journalism, all the while looking for that vocational soulmate, looking for a job that could help me self-actualize. And on the other side of all of that searching, I found that actually those sky-high expectations are what led to a lot of listlessness and disappointment in my own life and the life of many of my peers, frankly. So give us some help here. What are things we can do to put these ideas into practice and really get that healthy identity outside of work and what we do? 
Yeah, so I think much as an investor benefits from diversifying the sources of stocks in their portfolio, we too benefit from diversifying the identities and sources of meaning in our own life. And the research backs us up. It says that people with greater self-complexity who have cultivated different aspects of who they are are more resilient in the face of adversity. They are more innovative and creative when it comes to new ideas. And maybe most importantly, they get to be a fuller version of themselves because we're not just workers. We are also siblings and neighbors and friends and parents. And unless we take an active role in cultivating those other sides of ourselves, work can be sort of the central axis around which the rest of our life orbits and we squeeze life into the margins. This is such a great conversation, something I know I've had issues with in my life that maybe more recently I've become more aware of. Do you see, though, with Gen Z, this is something that's changing? And is there a risk or a worry that it could go too far in the other direction? I definitely think so. You know, we're seeing, especially driven by social media and Gen Z, the sort of resistance to hustle culture, to work centricity in our lives. But at the full end of the other spectrum, the sort of nihilist perspective where we treat work as a necessary evil, I don't think that's necessarily a recipe for fulfillment either. If we just think about our jobs as something that is we have to get through or that we don't want to engage or invest in, it can make days feel very long. And ultimately, we live in a material world. We need to work in order to pay for our material existence. But I advocate for something that I think a lot of the younger generation believes in, which is our jobs can be part of our identity, but it's risky when they become the sole source of identity and meaning in our lives. So important to find that balance. Simone Stolzoff, thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Coming up, if you are planning on hitting the pool this holiday weekend, you might have to swim at your own risk. That's because there's another nationwide lifeguard shortage this year, and it could affect your Memorial Day getaway. We'll tell you how after the break. Welcome back. If you're a dog owner, you know how hard it is getting one animal to pose for the camera. So take a look at this. Professional dog handler Jose Cesares managed to get a photo of more than 30 dogs looking directly at the camera, and they all appear to be sitting perfectly still. The dogs had been enjoying a birthday bash filled with splash pads and fetch games, and they did have a little training to sit still before the photo. It's no surprise the photo won the grand prize in the Love Your Neighborhood Photography Competition, run by the online platform next door. Suarez says patience is the key for getting some of these sorts of pictures. Such good dogs. They're sitting there. Such a cute picture. Well, as we get ready for the Memorial Day weekend and the unofficial start to the summer holiday season, the country is facing a massive lifeguard shortage. In fact, it's so bad, nearly half of America's public pools could be impacted. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock is at one of those pools in Hollywood, Florida, and joins us now with what cities are doing to try to fill the gap. Sam? Yeah, Valerie, good morning. That's half of some 309,000 pools, public pools across the country. Some of these communities, Valerie, are reaching out to high schools and marketing to kids there to try to get them signed up early. Some cities are raising their pay offers to create a financial incentive, but whatever it might be right now, it's really not working. Now, I'm in Hollywood, Florida, where this pool and community here is kind of a microcosm of what so many are dealing with. They have 10 people, they need 20, so they're scaling back on instruction and availability as a result of that crisis. With the unofficial start of summer set to make a big splash this Memorial Day weekend, pools and beaches across the country are grasping for a lifeline amid a major lifeguard shortage. We're in a crisis when it comes to lifeguarding in America. The American Lifeguard Association estimating that half of the nation's more than 300,000 public pools will have to either reduce their hours or close altogether because of inadequate staffing. Like Driftwood Community Pool in Hollywood, Florida. How many pools would you be operating if you had full staffing right now? We would try to operate three pools. But you have one right now? Right now we only have one pool to operate. Aquatic supervisor Chadley Fernandez tells me they have just 10 of the 20 employees that they need. We're going to have to cut back on some of the things that we can offer the local community. Right now we're cutting back on our swim lessons. Those visiting beaches in South Florida aren't wild about the prospect of swimming at their own risk. Mother Nature has a mind of its own, so you yeah. always have to be aware of the surroundings. Yeah. The nationwide shortage threatening summer fun coast to coast. 
The city of Seattle announcing it's closing three beaches and two pools this summer because they're nearly 80 lifeguards short to fully operate. And in New York City, the call is out. Lifeguards are not here yet, so we cannot open up. Out of a needed 1,400 lifeguards, they currently have just over a third, or about 500 on the payroll. We have been working since last September, doing a whole lot in terms of our recruitment to bring in more lifeguards. New York State even sweetening the job listing with a $1,000 bonus. Lifeguarding used to be a cool and popular summer gig, boosted in part by the hit show Baywatch. Now, potential summer hires are finding jobs with higher pay and no rigorous recertification every two years, like lifeguarding. And it takes a lot to become a lifeguard. Over 100 hours, and you have to uh, do medical training. You have to be a very strong swimmer, be in great shape. Some suggest it's time to rethink the role of lifeguard as a crucial emergency service. We are looking at lifeguards simply as a part-time employer, but they provide an essential job. A recruiting rush that can have life or death consequences. We've already had eight drownings this year in, in our community. And unfortunately, all the drownings have happened in areas where there aren't lifeguards. In New York City, they offered to raise the pay from $16 an hour to $21 an hour, Valerie. And still, that was not enough to deal with this massive deficit. The best advice we can give you heading into the holiday weekend right now is if there's no lifeguard on duty at your beach, don't go swimming. Back to you. And Sam, we saw you holding that flotation device earlier, so I wasn't sure if you were signing up to help fill the gap. <laughs> yeah, my swimming skills uh, <laughs> are not ones that should be trusted with any child's life, but it definitely makes for a good point and a good prop. But yes, um, when in doubt, be safe this holiday weekend. All right, Sam Brock, thank you so much. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.